It's spoiler in time, folks, and this is the show that is different from Cord Killers, but it's still hosted by myself, Tom Merritt, and my co-host, Brian Brushwood. Hello. But instead of talking about stuff that's going to come out or talking about how to watch things, we talk about things we've watched, like this week, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, Episode 2 of Season 1, Better Call Saul, Episode 9 of Season 4, and The Good Place, Season 3, Episode 2... Or three, depending on how you count. But it's the second time they've aired episodes this season. Anyway, uh, let's get to something else, Brian. What should it be? Uh, I guess we should check in on the winter movie draft. How are you already annoyed at the draft? <laughs> I'm already well, because annoyed because... Mike Range of From Dumb once again came at us in his weekly column, Brian. <laughs> However, I noticed that he still lists you as number one with 91 million, which makes me think it's a false flag operation. You're you're in cooperation with Mike Range, aren't you, Brian? I, man, if there there's nobody I would rather be in cooperation with than <laughs> Mike Range. Trust me, this dude is insightful and amazing. And if you haven't seen it, head on over to diamondclub.reddit.com. Take a look at his crumb dumb updates. That's the chat realm most ridiculously unofficial movie draft update mm, missive Minutes? memo memo got memo. almost uh, 90 percent there no, uh but uh, uh specifically he he uh, uh writes some really good uh satire and parody uh calls both of us out for calling him out uh it's great it's great and i love everything about it um man a star is born so so it sounded like from his mm. crumb dumb update that he felt like yes Venom had a big opening weekend. $80 million. But he seems to feel like uh, A Star is Born has legs and is yeah. going to eventually outperform Venom, uh, which, good God, do I hope so, because uh, I, 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 I think would he's like. probably right, Brian. Mm -hmm. Venom uh, comes out big, and yet everyone, including yourself, is telling me it's awful, which means no, re you're not going to get repeat viewings out of this. Uh, Star is Born is not the kind of movie where, you know, uh, people who love the Barbara Streisand and Judy Garland versions are going to make sure they line up to see it day one. They're going to see it when they get a chance to go to the theater. So I have a feeling it's going to last longer and keep churning out money. I'm going to guess they end up coming pretty close to even. Yeah, I, I, I certainly hope so. Um, I, having seen it now, understand the Oscar buzz around it. Uh, mm. uh, Lady Gaga is a phenomenal, a phenomenal acting talent. Uh, Bradley Cooper turns out is a phenomenal directing talent. Sam Elliott is amazing. Um, uh, as somebody who, who, uh, toured with a country music act for a full summer, uh, several, uh, it was, uh, uh, Brooks and Dunn, uh, Brad Paisley, uh, uh, uh Rascal Flatts, um, like that whole first third of the movie, I just was, I just kept, you know, elbowing Bonnie. I'm like, that's exactly what it's like. It's exactly like that. They nailed it. And then, uh, and then uh, at, at, as if like, I, it couldn't get more realistic to me with what I've seen with my own eyes. Then suddenly Greg Grunberg shows up <laughs> and I was just like, there's my buddy, Greg. What? what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, uh, so, so right now, movie draft wise, we're like, uh, Brian in front, 91 million, uh, Nicole with her 80 million from, from Venom. Uh, and then headed into a big week, Bad Times at the El Royale. That's another Nicole movie. First Man, that's Justin Robert Young's first movie. And Goosebumps 2, Haunted Halloween, which is my Team DTNS first movie. Now, are they, uh, I, I, I saw a trailer for this and there was no mention of Jack Black, but I've been told that he is involved with the franchise, but also was in uh, the house with the clock in the walls. Uh, that seems like a very Goosebumpsy type of movie. Uh, mm. is, is, are, are, are they holding back, like... If he's in it, why not feature him in the? Well, unless maybe that's a big a surprise, part. or it could be. A yeah, surprise. maybe a, maybe a, it's a it is a maybe it's a cameo, and with House of with a clock out, they didn't want to confuse things, yeah. so they're saving it as a as a goosebump moment. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll have goosebumps if he shows up. And Halloween. <laughs> All right. Uh, real quickly, before we get into our uh, spoiler in time, uh, we have breaking news, Brian. <laughs> yes. Uh, as we know, Alita was moved out of the winter movie draft uh, uh, time period. So I just got word moments ago from down the hall in the commissioner's office 
uh, that your movie Alita will be replaced with Vice, the Dick Cheney story, coming out December 26th. Well, that'll be $7 Starring million. Chevy dollars. Chase. Wait, no, not, wait, Chevy yes. Chase? No, yes. Christian oh, I'm Bale. sorry, Christian, uh, Christian Chevy Bale. Chevy Chase is in it. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Uh, it does star Chevy Chase, but Christian Bale is really the big attraction. Uh, you know what? Uh, okay. Uh, in general, I, I have found the commissioner's actions to be just, and I have no need to file a lawsuit just yet. Uh, you hear I that? Would hold my right. <laughs> oh, wait, All Chevy right, Chase uh, is not in this. I just thought it. I just thought this looked like no, Chevy Chase. That is Christian Bale playing Dick Cheney. Who looks, looks a lot looks like, a Chevy, lot Chase. like Chevy Chase? Whoa. Yeah, really does, yeah. Uh, yeah, no. I, 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 <laughs> like six months ago, there were some leaked photos of him on set, just, just, uh, just doing it up, <laughs> like looking, looking uh, uh, Cheney as hell. Uh, we also got an email from Mark Davy who wants to know if we would create a world movie draft league that takes the world gross, not the domestic gross. Uh, he points out you could use Box Office Mojo International if you want to get the money. I don't think the the getting the numbers was ever the reason we didn't. Uh, what do you, What do you think, Brian? Well, well, we we had talked about this early, early on, and and the only reason I put this in the doc is just to revisit that uh, to explain to people. It's like uh, we're all in the U.S. and we understand the gestalt of U.S. stuff. Um, it it would probably be a boringer game for us if. You know, we didn't know how well things were represented all over the world. And plus, also, there's an evening out of money. You know, there there, there are movies that 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 there's we less dynamic smell. range. Correct. Between the the yeah. grosses. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it becomes a more complex draft to manage. Not that it couldn't be managed, sure. but with varying release dates. You have to now take that into account. Talk about the problems we have with movies being moved out of the range. Uh, some movies don't, you know, it's like, well, do we count the China stuff? Because it's not coming out in China until summer, even though it's in the winter draft. So uh, I, I think the because scheduling... we're all in the U.S., we're playing the U.S. version, but we absolutely encourage other regions to create their own regional movie drafts. And if somebody can crack the code on how to make a world movie draft work, go for it. I think that'd be great. Yeah. And I think it's worth saying that a side effect of of going with international box office is that it would be extremely blockbuster heavy. Like you could whether whether a movie was good or bad, it, 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 it reduces the chances that a character driven story, as we understand it here in America, could we, we we could have one of those seven dollars uh, uh, investments that ends up paying off? Like for example, Lincoln. Uh, I won the winter movie draft what six years ago uh, or five years ago because I had Lincoln and because it got nominated for all the Oscars and I drifted across the victory line and that was really really great and that's something that wouldn't happen if we used international numbers. What do you? Brian, what, so Brian's point is he wouldn't have won if we used international. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you. Yes, that's that's why. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the good place. Uh, the second airing period. Uh, we're calling it second episode. I Is that a, is that are we agree? Sure. We just number yeah. it by yeah. the yeah. times it's been on the air now, even though this is technically the third, probably when they serialize it. Um, what did you think, Brian? Did, did it hold for you? I am really, really surprised at how good a job binging the first two seasons did to fully cement my emotional and intellectual investment going into this third season. I loved every second of the entire thing. Everything felt electric. Yes. It's great that we're uh, engaging in these uh, intellectual morality debates as we always have, but I actually cared about Michael. I cared about I cared about the doorman. I cared about that moment that the doorman was just like, "Hey, go on, crazy Earth guy." I got yeah, I, yeah. I cared about because you judge. did me right. You did me solid with that frog mug. It showed yeah. you were thinking about me. Like, yeah, everything is paying off, and it's like, and then they're they're there at the I don't know the Peanut Hut or wherever it was. It was trying to be like Texas in uh, uh, Australia. In Australia, and there's yeah. Janet, and she doesn't have her powers, and it's like I cared. I cared about all of it. It was great. I love everything about it. It's my it's my current absolute favorite show. I, I had to tell myself, even though I enjoyed a lot of this episode, that the way I was starting to feel is the way I felt at the beginning of season one and to just hang in there because I got a little bit bored. I'm like, yeah, I mean, and we did finally get a bit of a twist at the end, right? Uh, it, it, I thought it was going to be a bigger twist, 
but something exciting happens at the end, right? Where they, they jump back to earth. Um, but I, I don't know. I felt like, okay, so they're, you know, Trevor's going to try to stop them. And, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the next shift now. And I wonder if I'm on the crack where it's like, I love the shifts in the good place. So I'm just going to catch myself waiting for the next shift. And maybe I should take a cue from you, Brian, and just enjoy the moments, enjoy the Michael, enjoy the Janet, because they are delightful. I, ha I absolutely agree. Well, so one of the things that we've seen, uh, season after season is a regression to the mean. We see some kind of pivot and then we see everybody regress to the mean. And yes, we're regressing to the mean. We're starting to see GD get, you know, less decisive. Uh, we're starting to see uh, Eleanor get more annoyed with, with uh, great, great to all of that. That's the natural order of things. But in the meantime, uh, I, I, the star of the show is Michael for me at this point, like nothing about Michael, like everybody is constantly going to shift. They're going to get kicked to the outside and they're going to regress back to their normal. And but we know that Michael, Eleanor and Chidi are going to kind of start to fall for each other, but then not be able to. And yeah. Right. But meanwhile, Michael has an actual character arc and progression. And that's why I'm loving him. But, you know, first season, it was revealed that he was a bad guy. Uh, second season, we, we see him coming around to understanding their position. Third season, he's willing to compromise his own position and safety in the celestial marketplace in order to, because he believes in them so much. Uh, uh, this is all Michael's story. And, and the more I latch onto that, the more excited I get to, to see every little change, even, even the whole, like, you know, him working on between two, uh, acts, uh, a good Dick Tracy comeback. Uh, it was mm -hmm. uh, love all of that. The, the, it's it, you brought, bring up an interesting thought in my Brian, my brain. In your Brian. So, yeah. In, yeah. I guess <laughs> that's I call that's where brain. it comes from. It's, it's kind it's of your Brian. That I, I call it. Uh, every character, every main character has immense potential for growth. It's built in, right? The four characters that were in the good place, very, you know, like it is burned into us that they are all about growth. Can they grow into better people? Right. And that's, that's amazing to have four characters that you're invested that much into their growth and have that much potential. But Janet also has potential for growth because she's growing beyond her programming. And Michael, as you very well explained, has huge potential of gro for growth because he's abandoning being a demon and finding out what that means. I guess maybe what's happening right now is because it's Michael's story, I'm also like, oh, but I also want to find out about the other stories too. And I'm sure we will. All right, let's talk about Better Call Saul episode. Well, we're almost at the season finale, uh, season finale tonight, actually. So the penultimate episode of this season of Better Call Saul. Uh, I, I'm, I'll play the first card here, Brian. I have been very fascinated with how Kim and Saul uh, slash Jimmy would end up splitting, and they split them this week, which I, very obviously is not going to be the final split. But the way Jimmy decided to leave her felt too, too slipping Jimmy and, and didn't show me the growth that I have seen in Jimmy up till now. So I didn't quite buy it. I don't know why. It was definitely inconsistent. We have seen Jimmy, AKA Saul, incredibly uh, diligent, precise, focused, uh, tenacious. And we saw none of that in this case. Yeah, And also over over an error that is beneath him like you're telling me that he does like okay i get that you're building up the fact that he's got a blind spot when it comes to his brother and he doesn't understand why everyone else should be you know wants him to act sad about all that and cry crocodile tears and yes you could say maybe it's a principled stance that he doesn't want to participate in that in that in that farce um but you know, for him to it's it, he's overplaying the blind spot and then he's turning those weird frustrations on characters who don't deserve it. And it it, it rang hollow and, and just not so much hollow, but shallow to me, you know, like I'm just like, OK, uh, look, the guy I've watched for the last three years seems like he would see this coming a mile away. And what I'm seeing and 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 you haven't 
uh, the proverbial you have not given me enough to believe that this is all a big fake out play. Yeah. So right. it's like, uh, you're on provisional. I'll buy it for the moment. Right. Separate from that, you have the fact that it's not Kai that turns out to be the troublemaker, but the supervisor out of wanting to go home to his lady. Although we've been shown him being weak. And so I kind of felt like, oh, okay, that's, that's that paying off. Uh, it seems inconceivable that he would risk that much. He, he, he knows his bridge is burned and he's likely to be assassinated. Right. Well, like I, that's, I find that, it hard to believe he would try the great escape from Fring and expect that he would live. Well, it, exactly. And and I think that's the part that is also like he's already proven to us that he is sharp enough and smart enough and sees consequences. I mean, the dude uh, digs tunnels for a living. He thinks with yeah. the beginning in mind, uh, like what exactly does he believe is about to happen? Like at yeah. least inject some kind of like make me understand that he's operating on bad pretenses or or on bad foundational data that makes me understand why he would go for this and and instead you know i don't know it just seems like they just showed off a trick that i saw in an andrew main book um <laughs> the, uh, and, and maybe it'll work maybe maybe we'll find out why he thought he could get away with it even if he's like oh but i'm indispensable you need me to finish that tunnel they'll be like yeah okay we'll finish the tunnel and then we'll kill you i mean that's he he has to understand that's the kind of organization well, he's working for. And and I'll give the benefit of the doubt that they were setting something up with his unusually nervous going down to check out the, you know, the one. Uh, yeah, I felt like what we were again, like I felt something different was going to happen with Kim. I felt like, oh, he's he's sabotaging this whole thing. And, then, and now he's having cold feet about it. Uh, you know, you know, like I, I thought he was, he was trying to undermine this whole situation. So maybe that's it. Maybe he was supposed to sabotage this because he's in hawk to some other organization. And now he's at, at loose ends and his only escape was escape. Right. And, and to, to go on the run, because if he doesn't blow everybody up, uh, he's going to be killed by one organization. But if he, if he, if he does blow everybody up, then Fring will kill him. And he was at his wits end. I, I think I just wrote a better episode. Uh, for me anyway. So that's two storylines that are on provisional. Yeah. Uh, like I'm benefit of the doubt territory. And then you get um, uh, the one I would say fairly satisfying vignette was seeing the deep rage of Hector Salamanca radiating from within that bell, you know, mm -hmm. they, yep. they did a fine enough job of, of doing that. However, a side effect of all of that is what previously had been my favorite, most interesting character in the show with Nacho. Nacho ain't done crap for a season and a half now. And it's no, 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 come on, Brian. Uh, Nacho uh, looked very upset. I mean, and impotent. His impotent rage is something to behold. And I would, I, I, I know what, 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 what Michael Mondo is capable of on the acting side, and I want to see it. But, but, but instead, impotent rage is—it's a real waste of uh, true acting talent. Which puts Nacho in that provisional category of, oh well, if all this rage builds to something, then I guess it'll be worth it. But yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we'll find out tonight, I suppose. Uh, at least if it's going to happen this season. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. And Davey, who originally suggested this uh, as something we should watch, uh, wrote in and pointed out that he had read the book series over a dozen times when he was younger and wanted to point out that, in his opinion, the show does its job well by not following the books at all. There are a few coincidental similarities in some situations and some allusions to events that happened in like a long dark tea time of the soul, the, the first book. Uh, but it weaves a whole new and entrancing yarn. Uh, yeah, no, it's really good. I, I, I need you to guide me through this one, Tom, because due to scheduling difficulties, I only watched this. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit distracted. Prepping distracted. For, yeah. For, so, for, I mean, and basically we, we, the, the, the big points as I remember them in this episode are, uh, we finally, uh, see, uh, Elijah Wood start to act like Dirk Gently's assistant and Dirk, uh, starts to point it out with less resistance. Uh, the assassin lady, uh, 
turns out to be right about the guy who was fixing the car uh, when uh, she wanted to kill him because it turns out he wanted to kill them. Uh, and, and so we see some of those holistic magic tricks paying off. Um, and, uh, the puppy split, uh, between the, the, the missing woman and the dog, uh, became much more apparent. Although Dirk gently seems to get it wrong at this point by suggesting that, uh, they have hypnotized the dog to think it's the missing lady and hypnotized the lady to think she's a dog rather than what I think the viewers are expected to jump to the conclusion that it's some transference of one person to the other. This felt feels like a sort of a solidification of several rules. Uh, this is the moment. And maybe this is just a natural consequence of, of the ambition uh, the ambitious target set up in the very first episode in the second episode, they have to show the stuff paying off. Like, no, it really is a lottery ticket. He really did get rewarded by the universe, but also right. we're going to do verbal jujitsu to make it clear. Like uh, we're not bribing you and I can't guarantee you anything. It's just, you got to do the right thing and everything will work out or whatever. Um, and yes, it did feel like a settling in a, a, across the board. We also got a bit of the backstory of the, uh, the girl who was imprisoned with the three bald dudes and took one of them out. Um, but, but even then that didn't really progress us too, too, too much. No, cause she didn't get out. We had been kind of waiting for a while for her to get out, but um, you know, we'll let that, we'll let that happen. And it's a due course. Uh, we also, uh, we saw the, the, um, well, I can never remember the people in the van, their name. Oh, uh, the, uh, uh, right. I want to say right is three. Rowdy or, three. Rowdy three. The rowdy yeah. three. There's four of them. Uh, we saw them, uh, be faced off with a drum solo by, <laughs> by the sister. Yeah. That, that, that didn't, uh, that's that. In fact, that is the exact moment, you know, as it ended with her giving them the middle finger, uh, that I, that I was like, uh, did I just miss something? Was this more significant or was this setting up uh, foreshadowing for something? Yeah, uh, I guess we will find out next week. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us and watching the shows with us. And we will always be spoiling you every minute of the day in our hearts. And we'll spoil you on the show again next week. We're like a festering, fungus-covered old steak in the corner, spoiled as can be. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>